Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS Guy. Welcome to our next installment of the TOS Guy live stream. Today, we're going to address a topic brought up to me by our operations manager, Herb Rep. He said, is TOS rare? What do we really know about it? And I thought, what a great idea for a talk. I'm going to remind you, as always, to subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. Keep an eye on us on social media. We are TOS MRI on YouTube. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, keep an eye open for us. And please hit the like button for the video that helps us spread the word about TOS. So today we're going to talk about TOS. Is TOS rare? Let's start with the slides. What is the incidence of TOS? How many people show up every year with TOS? Well, let's take a look. I went through the medical literature and I tried to track down exactly how people had figured out how common TOS is throughout the country mostly, but there are a few other countries thrown in in the medical literature. So starting with Lee in a book that I contributed to in 2013, Jason Lee wrote down that the incidence of TOS is between three and 80 patients per 1,000 population. And that would be a lot. That would be 3,000 to 80,000 per million population, which actually seems rather high. Well, he had gotten this information from a paper written by Huang in 2004. What did Huang say in 2004? Well, he said the 3 to 80 per 1,000 population, and he had gotten that from two references, David Roos and Asa Wilborn in 1990. So I hadn't gotten to the bottom of it yet. I pulled up those papers and read through those. So in 1990, Roos wrote a paper with no mention at all of the incidents, no numbers. And I found Wilborn in 1990. He didn't have an estimate of incidence either. Although he did, as we'll look at later, come up with a concept of true neurogenic TOS versus disputed neurogenic TOS, something I have great interest in for a number of reasons. All right, let's go through the medical literature again. I found another reference by Tsao in 2013. What he said was that true neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, and we'll discuss what that is later, has an estimated incidence of only one person per million population. Now, that's really low. And he had gotten this from a surgeon at LSU, I believe, named Gelat in 1970. And then Wilborn in 1988 also said there was an estimated incidence of one patient with true neurogenic TOS per one million people in the population. And he referenced Gelat in 1970. So let's go find Gelat in 1970, an article called Wasting of the Hand Associated with a Cervical Rib or Band. He provided no estimate of the incidence. So right now I've got a very high number and I got a very low number. And none of these have demonstrated any methodology about how they calculated the incidence. But it seems like the medical literature is just repeating what others have said without verifying. So here's another one I looked at, Donadu in 2017. Again, he referred strictly to true neurogenic TOS. He gave up a proportion of this. He said all cases of neurogenic TOS, true neurogenic TOS accounts for 1% of those, meaning all patients with neurogenic TOS, 99% have the disputed or nonspecific form of TOS. We'll get into this a little bit later. He also quoted one patient with true neurogenic TOS per 1 million people in the population. Again, what I consider to be a low number based on my experience and my knowledge of the experience of others in the country, as well as the medical literature. Now, he referenced a guy named Ferranti from 2012. Ferranti worked with Asa Wilborn, same part of the people who came up with the division of true versus disputed neurogenic TOS. Donadu also said in 2017 that if you had nonspecific TOS, that would be 99% of all cases. He gave no estimate of the overall incidence of neurogenic TOS, as all those other papers. Nothing based on any data that I could find. And he had referenced Ferranti in 2012, who worked with Asa Wilborn, and a guy named Christo, who I think is at MGH in Boston. So let's go see what we find for Ferranti in 2012. Well, all Ferranti did was refer back to papers, previous papers with Wilborn. So again, he gave no specific incidents, no numbers, no methodology. 
So you can see where I'm going with this. I am unable to find anybody who really came up with a measurement of how many people have neurogenic TOS. Christo, the guy I mentioned just before, he again mentioned that of all cases of neurogenic TOS, 99% are this disputed type, which means that true neurogenic TOS, as we'll see in a little bit, is exceedingly rare, maybe one patient per million people. And then he quoted a guy named Adesoy in 1996. I'm not going to go further with this. Every step I go deeper into the literature, there's no incidence that I can see supported by a methodology or numbers. Okay. And it makes me ask, why is it so hard to pin down this number? How many people have TOS? Now, if you're confused, I'm confused too. But I have some ideas about how to figure out what's going on here. So, as I've said before in previous videos, and as I've written on my website and a couple of blog posts, we don't have a steady, solid, agreed upon diagnosis for neurogenic TOS. There is no gold standard or reference standard, I think is the more common term used nowadays. There is no one test, no clinical exam, no chemical test in the blood that people all agree this is neurogenic TOS. That's a problem because if you can't do that, you can't count how many people have neurogenic TOS and you can't calculate this incidence. Second point, TOS is heterogeneous. You've perhaps heard me talk before about a paper written by Pete in 1956. Pete was a tr fellowship trainee. He wasn't even fully graduated as a physician. And he took all these previous papers listing many different forms of TOS, many different anatomic abnormalities, many different provocative maneuvers ever since the early 1800s. And he said, this whole thing is too confusing. It's hard to figure out what's going on because there are so many varieties. So let's lump it all together and call it thoracic outlet syndrome. Now that doesn't help if you take a heterogeneous group of patients and you force them into an artificial box. Yes, there are some commonalities. All of them have some kind of symptoms related to compression or stretching of the neurovascular bundle. That could mean the brachial plexus, the subclavian artery, or the subclavian vein in any combination of two or three or just one of them. So he made a box for this, and in my opinion, that box does not work so well, and it makes it hard for us to find these patients because there are so many varieties that we try to lump together. It also makes research on them difficult because any researcher starts with a heterogeneous group of patients. When they apply a diagnostic test or a treatment, they're going to get different results because it's not just one disease. All right, point number three. We do have a persistent low awareness within the medical community. Now, there are some great docs out there from Boston to San Francisco, from north to south, Florida to Minnesota. But, you know, every different community has a different specialist handling TOS. Every different community has a different level of awareness. Docs in a community, no matter how well they're trained, no matter how great they are at their field, sometimes just know very little to nothing about TOS, or they just never see it in the patients who come to see them. So this heterogeneity throughout the medical community is challenging. You as a patient may not find a doc, no matter how good she or he is, who knows TOS. That's a problem. And as you know, I always preach this, we're trying to raise awareness among patients. We also try to try to raise awareness among physicians that we talk to and new ones that we meet. And number four, there is an ongoing debate within the medical community. Like many other diseases, and especially the ones that are tough to handle and tough to diagnose, there is ongoing debate. People form opinions. They believe certain tests work better than others. And until we have proof of a solid standard reference point, a reference standard or a gold standard, you're going to have these arguments. These arguments were made worse by this guy, Wilborn, who had a very good reputation. I'm not mean to insult him or Ferranti who worked with him. I'll get into that a little bit later. Like right now. So Roos, David Roos, a surgeon in Colorado who really started us on the modern surgical approach to TOS by doing a transaxillary surgery. Among his surgical patients and among cadavers he studied, he found a bunch of soft tissue abnormalities in the thoracic outlet, different kinds of fibrous bands associated with the lung or the brachial plexus or the ribs or the elongated C7 transverse process or a cervical rib. 
and he cataloged these into many types and he went looking for them at surgery. So he and this fellow, Asa Wilborn, who is a neurologist at the Cleveland Clinic, wrote a couple of papers. Roos's paper was, the thoracic outlet syndrome is underdiagnosed. And Wilborn responded by saying, the thoracic outlet syndrome is overdiagnosed. It's two, not really scientific articles, it's opinion pieces by these two physicians. And they wrote back and forth in this journal for quite a while. Now, Wilborn referred to an earlier chapter he had written in a book where he had divided neurogenic TOS into true neurogenic TOS and disputed neurogenic TOS. And he referenced himself. Here is his true neurogenic TOS. He listed five points here. He said, you have neurogenic TOS when you have all five of these. Characteristic symptom profile. That means pain, numbness, weakness, importantly, in the muscles, usually in the hand, but it can involve the forearm as well. Obvious clinical findings like wasting of the muscles of the hand. Now, I've talked about this before. Any entrapment neuropathy, if you have it severe enough or long enough, you're going to eventually damage those muscles at the end of that nerve pathway. And once those muscles are damaged and they start wasting away, it's often hard or impossible to recover that strength and that bulk. He said confirmatory results of laboratory studies. And in particular, he was referring to electrophysiologic studies called EMG and nerve conduction velocity. And that's a test he used a lot for a lot of other diseases. But that test, EMG, NCV, has challenges when you're looking at the brachial plexus. You can't examine the, the plexus directly with needles and probes and surface patches. It's very hard to examine. So you have to do a couple of manipulations, like doing a super maximal impulse in the arm, waiting for it to go backwards against the direction of the nerve, bounce around the spinal cord, out through the plexus, and then back down to your receiver. Not my specialty. I'm not going to claim I'm an expert in it. But looking at the literature, you have to go extra steps to do a electrophysiologic study of the brachial plexus. But he insisted that this true neurogenic TOS had to have positive electrophysiologic studies. And if it didn't, it was nonspecific or disputed TOS. By the way, disputed is a bad word because it means there's some pejorative value to it. It's disputed. There are people who don't think it's real. You could have nonspecific neurogenic TOS. Okay. But he used the word disputed a lot, and that made things harder. His next point was that you had to have worldwide recognition of neurogenic TOS as a unique entity. Now, that application means that we could never find a new disease because when you first come up with it, even if you're the first 100 doctors who see this disease, you don't have worldwide recognition. So if you're going to exclude diseases on that basis, we would never find a new disease. It's just highly restrictive, a very high bar to clear. And finally, he said it had to have low incidence. Now, how the hell would he know? There were no diagnostic criteria. How do we know who had the disease and who didn't? To this day, since the 1990s, we don't have a reference standard. So if I claim that a disease has to have a low incidence to be that true disease, then we're intentionally eliminating any other form of the disease. Again, this is an arbitrary decision that created an artificially high bar. So look at this list of five. This was what he considered true neurogenic TOS. And what it boiled down to was you have all the symptoms as a TOS patient that you have, all the sensory symptoms, but you also had weakness in your hands usually and wasting of the muscles in the hand, which in any other case would mean an end stage entrapment neuropathy. End stage meaning it had progressed from severity or chronicity to be severe, and it was at the worst stage. And by the way, in entrapment neuropathies, when they're end stage and you release the pressure on the nerve, you often do not get back the motor function. So nobody wants to wait that long. No surgeon would wait to treat any other entrapment neuropathy until it was end stage. It's like saying, I did a chest x-ray on you, Mr. Jones, and there's a mass in your lung, which could be lung cancer, but I won't believe it until it's spread to your liver and your bones and your brain. Then I'll believe it. Well, obviously, none of us would do that. We wouldn't wait for that confirmation. There can be mild forms of any disease and moderate forms of any disease. Every disease, for the most part, progresses from mild to moderate to severe. And if you wait until you have the severe form of the disease, then you've lost the chance to treat, to remove pain and suffering for a patient, and to get a better outcome. 
Okay, so disputed neurogenic TOS, as he called it. He said, number one, it was rarely mentioned in the neurologic literature, meaning only he and his buddies, the neurologists, were allowed to diagnose this. If it sounds artificial, it is artificial. Other people like neurosurgeons have been finding these symptom complexes of nonspecific or disputed neurogenic TOS. Why does Asa Wilborn insist it can only be diagnosed by a neurologist? That seems to me to be a little self-centered and self-serving. Secondly, he said there was a refusal of the proponents of neurogenic TOS, the people who said, yes, there's this other disease. They refused to classify it as a separate entity. In other words, he had set up this classification, true or severe or end-stage neurogenic TOS, and all the other people with neurogenic TOS. He wanted the people who supported that other diagnosis to admit that it was different than the form he had found and called true. So by definition, he was saying, if you don't accept this very limited form of the disease that I defined, then I won't listen to you. Again, pretty self-serving and based only on his opinion which was really not based on data, as we'll see. Fourth, he said there was a lack of consensus among its advocates. That's true. There's so many different things that TOS patients have. If there were one simple form, we'd all be diagnosing it, but it's a challenging disease. There are a lot of different patterns of the disease because there are a lot of different underlying anatomic and pathophysiologic changes. Okay, we've discussed this before on some of the lectures on anatomy. We've discussed this with some of our clinical docs who have been our guest speakers. It's hard to diagnose. And the fact that all these people who saw this other disease didn't all agree on the same thing was because of the nature of the disease, not because they were trying to be confusing. So here he created another artificial barrier. And finally, he said that the incidence varies between providers. You could go city to city. In one city, they would never see TOS. And in another city, they would see lots of it, like San Francisco in the 1970s had Ron Stoney, had some great people here. I know many great people in San Francisco. Los Angeles had people who have gone on to stellar careers who diagnosed it. But Wichita, Kansas, or Manhattan, New York, or pick another big city, Chicago, Illinois, there are different levels and different specialists, some people who see the disease and some don't. And the fact that the incidents would vary between specialists or cities is not scientific at all. It just means that humans are missing the diagnosis, okay? Now, Jalad wrote this paper that I mentioned called Wasting of the Hand Associated with a Cervical Rib or Band. And he wrote it in 1970, 20 years before Wilborn came out and said, from now on, I'm splitting up TOS. So there's this really rare form that only I will diagnose and the rest of you can go sit on attack. All right. This is now 20 years before that. Jalot wrote this paper. And this is a paper that Wilborn and Ferrante referred to a lot in all the papers they wrote. And other people to this day are still referring to that paper to say, see, there's an incidence of one patient with TOS per million population. Now, this is the length of the paper here. Jalot had nine patients. That's it. Just nine patients. Pretty small sample size. All of them had pain, sensory abnormalities in the arm and in the hand. All of them had muscle wasting in the hand and weakness. All of them had on x-ray, because there wasn't an MRI at the time, they had an elongated C7 transverse process or a cervical rib. And at surgery, he found that all those nine patients, he excluded others, but all those nine patients had a sharp fibrous band, fibrous band, attached to the elongated C7 transverse process or to the cervical rib, the band had a sharp edge and the band was clearly impinging on the C8 and T1 nerve roots of the brachial plexus. This was his patient population. All right, they all had, well, excuse me, some of them had positive electrophysiologic tests, the EMG and nerve conduction velocity. Not all of them, just some of them, okay? So remember, Wilborn is basing all of his stuff on this paper to a great extent and calling this a paper of great credibility. Okay. Interestingly, there are many problems with this. Number one, if you look closely at his paper, Gillot's paper in 1970, you find that his patients had sensory disturbances over about eight years, but they only had motor disturbances, weakness or wasting for four and a half years. Okay, so almost twice as many patients had sensory symptoms or they had it for twice as long 
as they had motor symptoms, meaning the sensory symptoms were first, okay? And patients had sensory symptoms before they developed motor symptoms. That fits with what we understand about disputed TOS, that it's just a spectrum of the disease. You can have sensory symptoms clearly without motor symptoms. And like every other entrapment neuropathy, I say this over and over again, you want to treat it before you get the motor abnormalities. Okay, you don't wait until you have proof. Okay, Jalot found that after surgery, the pain and the paresthesias in eight of nine patients relieved within just a few days to a week or so. So clearly their sensory symptoms went away. He found that the motor symptoms did not go away. They did not progress and the wasting of the hand muscles did not progress, but they did not get better. And here you see that I said five of nine patients were actually followed for a very long time, five to eight years. None of the muscle changes improved, which just reinforces the fact that with entrapment neuropathies, you don't wait until you get motor involvement. You don't wait for the muscles to be affected because that's usually unresolvable and irreversible. He also noted that there was no improvement in the electrophysiologic signs. Now remember, I said that these patients had symptoms. They had had the disease for a long time. And in the previous slide, I noted that they, there were some that had positive electrophysiologic signs, but not all of them. Many of them had normal electrophysiologic tests, which seems to be conveniently forgotten or ignored by Wilborn because he insisted on that positive test to make the diagnosis. So it had been proven earlier that even with surgery showing a sharp fibrous band pressing on the brachial plexus with all the symptoms and the wasting of muscles, even in those patients, some of them didn't have positive EPS tests, okay? So I'm drawing to a close shortly here. What do we know right now about the incidence of TOS and how can we learn more about that? And really more importantly, how does this affect TOS patients? Do you, as a TOS patient, get seen by the right doctor so that you count as part of the incidence? Do you get seen soon enough? That counts. That's important. Uh, I'm going to refer to a paper by Landry in 2000, where um, he threw in a little chart, very interesting, that was total physicians seen by TOS patients. And for the patients who had conservative treatment by the time they entered Landry's study, they had seen over four doctors each. And the ones that ended up going to surgery had ended up seeing almost seven doctors before they got to Landry's study. Now, this is statistically different based on his patient size, but you could see that the longer you wait, the more likely the disease is going to progress to the point where you need surgery and won't recover from physical therapy. It also reinforces the fact that many of you have probably lived through that you see not one doc, not two, not three, but four, five, six, seven, before you get a diagnosis and treatment. And that's something that's really important for us to improve. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So I'd like to think we do have a positive outlook for future TOS patients. And I'll cover some points that we've covered before. First of all, we believe, honestly and truly, over 20 plus years of being in this field, that there is growing awareness of TOS. And I think it's accelerating. We're seeing more elite athletes uh, when you see ESPN.com and you listen to the radio, you're hearing about people like Steven Strasberg and David Cohn and Matt Harvey being diagnosed with TOS. That helps, right? We know social media and a lot of you are active on social media and that's really tremendously helping. We believe that that's really increasing the rate and accelerating the awareness that people can have for TOS. And then you find a lot of you patients are advocating for yourselves and advocating for others and helping others find information and cooperating together to form groups. And I think that's critically important, not just for emotional support, but for getting people introduced to the right kind of pathways. And here I'll throw in a little piece I, uh, I've been saying recently about social media. Social media is great places like Facebook to go and find information about TOS. It's really best for finding where to get help. I would always recommend to people that they're very careful about the help they do accept that's direct medical decision-making or treatment on one of these outlets, because those aren't doctors offering advice, but you should absolutely use it to find the care providers who can help you and to find references for information to learn more about TOS. Now, in quote unquote, the establishment, which has changed slowly as large establishments do, the healthcare system, we've seen growth and change in a positive way in that regard. We do know that there are large prestigious universities like Harvard, 
UCSD, UCLA, UCSF, really great places uh, that now have dedicated TOS clinics. And many of the docs that graduate from those training programs, training programs will go on and have their own TOS practices. So that's a good step. We know that diagnostic tests are improving, not just the MRIs that we do, but people are doing selective injections using things like Botox and other biologically active agents, and that's helping. And then there are novel surgical and non-surgical modalities and techniques that are being developed and tried. So we believe that one of the important things is that patients and doctors work together, no matter how different we are, no matter how different I might be than a vascular surgeon, if we can all work together, we can really make great progress. And that is the talk about, is TOS rare? So I think the answer is, no, I don't believe it's rare. From all these reports I've seen of incidents, I don't think any of them are accurate, but we talk to patients and doctors every day and we see a lot of it. It can be mild disease, it can be moderate, it can be severe, but I think it's there in a lot of people and it's worse now for a couple of reasons. One is we're all using computers like we never have before and assuming unhealthy postures. And number two, I think we see it a lot in car accidents and um, uh, work-related incidents, especially as related to non-ergonomic computers and workstations. So with that, I'm going to quit the talk, and we're going to see if we have questions to take. Herb, how are we doing? All right. Arizona 76, you get the first question for today. Hello. I have at least five. Oh, TOS Unbound. Great. We've seen you before. Thanks for coming back. It's good. We've had good discussions with you. I appreciate it. I have at least five patients with numbness and tingling in the hand following a shoulder injury in my clinic working with postal workers. Yeah, so postal workers, I, I feel for them. They have a lot of unhealthy postures, as I'm sure you know. I'm lecturing to the choir here. Uh, they have to carry things that can sometimes be heavy. And uh, the trucks that they're in, you know, I'm not sure that this is very ergonomic. Now, in terms of the shoulder injury leading to numbness and tingling, you're probably better qualified than I am to assess what happened, how the balance of their body, how their posture has changed. But if it's something like a seatbelt injury, then what that does is it can drive the shoulder back and the collarbone back, and it can impact on the brachial plexus. We see that on the MRIs. So I think um, anything that alters the biomechanics and the symmetricity of the body, the symmetric quality of it, or that hurts muscles so that you go into a guarding position and protect yourself from pain can lead to the kind of posture that can create TOS. But with specialists like you around who can address those issues, I, I believe there's a really good hope if it's caught early to treat them with non-surgical techniques to regain the normal posture and the normal symmetric nature of the body. Christoph Bobenreith, hi. Thanks for your presentation. Of course, thank you for coming here. Besides anterior scalene and pec minor muscles, is there any other muscle for Botox injection for TOS? That's, that's good. So yes, docs will do injections. It's not just Botox. Sometimes they'll use lidocaine for a temporary test. People are trying some other things as well as hydrodissection. I'll describe that in a second. The anterior scalene is by far the most targeted muscle. And um, I don't think it's scientifically proven. But there is some anecdotal data, which I've experienced myself. When you inject a TOS patient's anterior scalene muscle with lidocaine, a local anesthetic, a lot of them will respond and feel a lot better. And not just locally, but the, the pain, nerve pain radiating down their arm is better. Now, the logic given for why this occurs by many in the field is that the pec minor is pressing on the brachial plexus as the plexus passes behind it. That's not true according to imaging data, okay? That's not true according to imaging literature or to my experience. I don't believe there's very often you get compression here. But in my opinion, the pec minor can be tense and it can change the position of the shoulder girdle. So injecting it and relaxing it with Botox or lidocaine may help change the position of the shoulder and relieve some pressure, either compression or tension on the brachial plexus. Now, people besides the pec minor I'm um, sorry, I'm confusing here, but the pec, that's the pec minor. There's the anterior scalene. The anterior scalene, if it's tight, will uh, tend to make your neck pull forward like this with your chin towards your chest. Also, the brachial plexus can go through the anterior scalene. It can go around the front instead of the back of the anterior scalene. 
and sometimes the anterior and middle scalene muscles arise from a very complex mass that doesn't have clean separation. So if you've got tension in the anterior scalene muscle and you do an injection and relax it, it can relax some of those muscle fibers around the nerve complex and reduce tension on them. Okay? Um, so that's anterior scalene. Uh, pec minor, I mentioned, it can change shoulder girdle. Some people will inject the subclavius muscle. It rides just underneath the collarbone. The function of it, as far as I know, is to help uh, relieve some pressure on the clavicle. Most bones in the body have muscles that help regulate how much pressure they have on them. So you decrease fractures and dislocations. The subclavius muscle can be big at points and sometimes can press on the plexus, although not as much as the collarbone against the rib. Um, so that's a, a distant third in terms of how many muscles are injected. Um, it might even be fourth because some people inject the middle scaling muscle. Now that one, I have a harder time explaining. Uh, there is a nerve that goes through the middle scaling called the long thoracic nerve. It's made up from the C5, C6, and C7 nerve roots. It's often not just one nerve, but a bundle of different nerves, like two, three, four little branches. Dr. Hagen was on uh, two weeks ago, and he described how carefully he is dissecting that nerve out because of its variability. But I would guess that if you inject a calming or relaxing medicine like lidocaine into the middle scaling, you can relieve pressure on the long thoracic nerve. So anterior scaling muscle is the most injected. Uh, without data, I would guess from talking to people around the country that the pec minor is the second most injected. Then after that, it's a distant third with the uh, scaling medius or the middle scaling muscle and the um, subclavius muscle. Other than that, I haven't seen people do other injections into these muscles of the thoracic outlet. Thank you. And any thoughts on why some people respond better to strengthening and stretching and do not need a gentle approach in TOS physical therapy? So I'm going to reserve my opinion on this because uh, I don't really have any experience doing physical therapy. I know we've had uh, Steve uh, Talakowski on several times and I've spoken to other physical therapists. Um, one who works in San Francisco and deals with a lot of local um, major league athletes. Uh, she has told me that uh, in the patients she sees that she believes it starts with uh, laxity of the shoulder. That a lot of these people are major league pitchers. And they'll, because of the posture they assume and the force they generate in their shoulders, start getting laxity of the shoulder joint. There's a labrum you may have heard about, which deepens the cup of the shoulder joint. And that labrum is just fibrous tissue and over time can get tears or loosen up. So she believes that people get this loosening of that shoulder joint and then they get impingement or stresses on the rotator cuff. And then they may get tears, whether full thickness or partial thickness or tendinosis of the rotator cuff. And through all of this, and probably asymmetry of the muscles because you're using one arm so much more than the other, they get abnormal neck posture and shoulder girdle posture. And that secondarily leads to TOS. So she takes a different approach than Steve does. And she addresses a lot of the shoulder issues first, which may include some strengthening. Uh, that may be, a, you know, if you wanna to speak to someone like that, just reach out to us, we can connect you. But I would be about as far as I would go towards just assuming, because I don't know for sure. I don't do physical therapy myself. Um, and we saw Steve uh, Talakowski say he always works with his patients on calming everything down first. Okay. I hope that helps a little bit. So we have another question here. Is there any sleeping position recommended for most TOS patients? Yeah, it's an interesting story. There's... um. I think it was Todd in the 1910s and 1920s, and he had seen patients who got TOS, but vascular forms like arterial or venous from having their arms over their head at work. So he decided to sleep with his arm over his head, and he did it for like seven years. Nothing happened until bang, all of a sudden, uh, I think he got um, arterial thrombosis. And so it was very sudden for him. So I would say in general, you don't want your arms over your head when you sleep. But outside of that, again, because I don't work with patients directly and do physical exams, um, and I don't know any literature on sleeping position, honestly. So I don't know that I can offer more. Sorry, it's a good question. 
Hi, Brad. I do not understand completely why EMG is not a good way to assess the brachial plexus in TOS. Could you elaborate, please? Okay, so EMG, electromyography, and nerve conduction velocity are tests that measure the function of nerves. Now, some of them are pretty simple. If you want to measure, for instance, the carpal tunnel, which is at the wrist, you can put a stimulator here and then a receiver here, and then you apply impulses and it follows the normal pathway of the nerve and you can measure the velocity of that segment of the nerve. And we know from checking many normal people what a normal velocity is. You can also check the shape of that curve. Okay, so you can see that it follows a normal shape, has normal velocity. Um, EMG is where you put needles actually into muscles and you would pick the nerve you're interested in studying. In the case of the cubital tunnel, it's the median nerve. And so it's mostly muscles in the, the fleshy part of the thumb. You put needles in and you look for things like spontaneous discharges or little spikes of electrical activity or what happens when the nerves contract that muscle. And that's, that's a basic understanding. Now, you can't do this so easily with deeper nerves like the brachial plexus. For one thing, you're not going to stick needles up here. For a second thing, if you wanted to send a nerve impulse from proximal to distal, you'd have to get into a nerve root coming out of the cervical spine if you wanted to go forward through the brachial plexus. So that's a really dangerous territory. You would never just stick a needle in there. And so the next part of it is that the brachial plexus not only is five nerve roots, but they branch and twist a lot. They give off certain parts to other branches. They form trunks and divisions and cords. And because of the complex branching and because it's different in every person, electrical waves are going to be very complex. Imagine if you had a transatlantic cable going from New York to London and you had a special ship and you dropped an anchor to the bottom of the ocean and you had a, a little magnetic sensor that would drop around the transatlantic cable and it would gather signals and then judge when some of the wires had broken or were not working so well. Well, you have thousands and thousands of these wires um, in a complex network. The signal would just be a wash in, in all kinds of signals. How would you tease out just a few wires or a few abnormal things? That'd be very hard. So what you're dealing with is a group of large nerves and clusters of nerves that branch in a complex and unpredictable manner. And there's thousands of nerve fibers. So that's a starting point to make it hard to do that. And in my understanding is to get the brachial plexus, you use an, an F wave, which is where you start in a nerve here and you create a supra maximal impulse. In other words, such a strong impulse that while it goes, follows the normal course of the nerve, it also goes backwards, goes through the brachial plexus, all the complexity there, goes into the spinal cord and then reflects and some of it comes back out through all the branches of the plexus and back to the nerve where you can measure it. Now, that means that you've got all these interfering things in the way, like the transatlantic cable. There's just too many things interfering with your signal. There's no data that I know of that shows that that has any accuracy for finding brachial plexus disease. Another thing I'll point out is that EMGs and NCVs um, usually work on larger axons, meaning motor nerves that have a myelin coat. And these nerves tend to be protected in TOS. The damage tends to occur to the peripheral smaller caliber nerves up here in the brachial plexus. And those are almost always sensory nerves. And that's why patients get sensory symptoms like paresthesias, tingling, numbness, burning before they get weakness and motor symptoms. So if you could use an EMG NCV, you'd be waiting to get damage to the motor nerves in most cases, even if you could find it in this complex pathway. And by the time you get motor damage, it's later in the course of the disease. So you want to find it earlier. So people will use EMG, sometimes insurance companies insist on it, to rule out other things. But uh, it's not a diagnostic qualifier for the brachial plexus. And if it's negative, every single TOS specialist I've ever spoken with says, I don't care. EMG is negative or positive. If I think clinically it's TOS, that's not going to change my mind. So thanks. I know it's a complex question, but I, I appreciate it. TOS inbound. Thank you. Love the work you're doing, Dr. Worden. I'm on my other account now. Well, I'm really glad that you uh, have come in a while ago and participating with really good questions. Thank you. And again, if you want to reach out and we can talk, and I'd love to hear more about what you're doing in a clinic. Living with TOS. Hi. Original diagnosis via ultrasound, bilateral uh, severe vein impingement, and moderate artery impingement three years ago. 
recent CT scan and MRI both showed nothing. Pain and issues going on for nine years now. I'm sorry to hear that. Is this common for multiple tests done and various results? Thank you, Valerie. Hi, Valerie. Um, so a couple, more than a couple things in my mind. Um, I'll try to do this in an organized manner. Uh, and I, I can't diagnose you specifically. We, we always talk about this. We can talk in generalities, but reach out to us and we can set up a consult and help you. For the edification of everybody here, though, I talk about these problems because they're, they're fairly common. So ultrasound has some value in TOS for a number of things. I do not think it's the best test for any one of them. What it can do uh, is in real time, it can show blood flow in the arteries and the veins. Now, it can't show directly where the collarbone and the rib come together. Ultrasound does not penetrate bone or gas. It can't look into the lung. So you can't see the most common spot where we get compression of the nerves, arteries, or veins. But if you have blood flow going through the artery, passing through this narrowed area, then you can see the blood flow before the collarbone and after the collarbone. And while you may not directly see the compression of the artery, you can see the change in waveform. Now, it has been shown in some patients that they get arterial compression, just normal people who are not TOS patients, they don't have symptoms. If you raise your arms enough, you can get compression of your artery. So by itself, that is not diagnostic of neurogenic TOS, okay? And you're having neurogenic symptoms. But in general, when Adson did his test, which is really a test of the radial pulse down here, but it's, it's measuring what happens up here when you maneuver the patient. He would get the patient into a provocative maneuver with a, a neck twist, holding the wrist far down and having the patient take a deep breath. His reasoning was that if the artery is compressed when you do that, well, the artery is close to the plexus and therefore compression of the artery would tell you who has compression of the plexus. Now, that was 1920s and he's not around. I can't ask him what he thought, but I don't know how sure he was of that. Maybe he said it's an indicator, but it's not perfect. I don't know. That's what he had at the time. But it's not true. We know that from modern imaging. You can compress the artery without compressing the plexus. You can compress the plexus without compressing the artery. The first rib is a curved structure in multiple dimensions. The collarbone, the clavicle, is S-shaped, and it rotates among three dimensions. And so no one can predict right now how the collarbone and the rib are going to come together. Okay, that's what we see on MRI. And you can see it on CAT scan, too, because you see the bones well on CAT scan. So number one. People can get arterial compression without nerve compression. Number two, same exact thing with the veins. It's a complex space. It's a different space for the vein than it is for the artery, than it is for the plexus. So you can get compression of veins. And many people who have no symptoms get compression of the veins to one extent or another when they raise the arms over their head. This has been shown in the 1980s by CAT scan in Northwestern in Chicago, for example, and other papers as well. Now, having CT or MRI after that, it depends. What did they do? Did they do it with arms down and arms up? Were the radiologists experienced reading TOS? Because honestly, it takes a while to be good at this. It takes a while and a lot of interest and, in, you know, being dumb enough to go pull up medical literature and read about the incidence of TOS. I love this stuff. You know, not every radiologist does. So you need to make sure that the a CAT scan and MRI would be done in the provocative maneuver with the arms up, that the radiologist is qualified to read them. Uh, you know, I'm not as good at ankles as I am at shoulder MRIs, perhaps. So um, the tests, having ultrasound positive for the vascular work does not show where the compression occurs, but it does show change in blood flow. That's suggestive that it could be TOS. If it were completely normal, it wouldn't rule out TOS. And having cross-sectional imaging like CAT scan or MRI needs to be done the right way by the right person. And again, I'd say, Valerie, you know, reach out to us if there's something that we can help with directly, we can discuss privately, because this is not really the forum for dedicated uh, individual diagnoses. And thank you for a good question. Jonathan says, is there data regarding the prevalence of TOS in special populations such as athletes? That's really good. The um, We see papers all the time that come through um, college-level um College level volleyball player diagnosed with TOS, baseball pitcher treated with this and that. Um, not a lot of papers that group those together and really come up with good statistics that I'm aware of. But there was a paper that Thompson in St. Louis wrote about um, baseball pitchers and how their statistics didn't change once they had the surgery. And I think the intent of the paper was to show that 
the patients, uh, meaning the pitchers, major league pitchers, who were not named individually, of course, that once they had symptoms, they got surgery to get rid of their symptoms and their, their statistics stayed the same. So that was good, I think. But my critique of the paper, honestly, is that you have a, a high value property, a baseball pitcher, you know, and he's, you know, doing really great. He doesn't go to surgery at the first twinge. You know, um, a lot of these pitchers, they, you know, over the past 20 years, I've watched this, you know, they have arm pain, they're tired, they're losing the zip on their fastball, they're losing their control, things are happening. And over two months, six months, a season, a season and a half, you know, you have different coaches working with them. Because let's face it, these elite athletes have up years and down years. And so what happens is by the time they get to be diagnosed and get surgery, they have their good years, but they've also mixed in, you know, a bad year or two. So what wasn't done in the paper was to take their best years before symptoms and stop where the symptoms started. Right there is where if you're going to assume they had TOS, they had it at that particular week where they started getting symptoms. Take the statistics before that time and compare it to the statistics after that time, not to the date of surgery. That would be a critique of mine. I'm not criticizing, you know, Thompson. I mean, he's very, very experienced. He writes a lot of papers. He's a vascular surgeon at Washington University. I think they have their own clinic there. But I think that would tell more data. You know, I watched um, my hometown team, the New York Mets. It's really hard to root for them. Finally, they're having a good year this year. But Matt Harvey was an awesome pitcher. And then he started having all kinds of problems. And he was diagnosed with and operated on for thoracic outlet syndrome. And his career, unfortunately, is sad since then. His numbers have been terrible. And he's not the only one that the numbers have fallen off a cliff. So um, I don't know. There's a lot of literature beyond that paper that's out there. And that paper itself, I don't think, supports um, what they're trying to support, which is to go to surgery. And their diagnostic is a clinical diagnosis. And we've discussed in today's talk, you know, a little bit, I think I've implied that because there's no reference standard, you can't diagnose TOS. You know, in some of these pictures, do they really have TOS? I have to question that because I see it in other patients. And I, I don't agree with getting a picture diagnosed like that without an MRI. You know, we've had the chance to do some professional athletes. And, you know, I think we really contributed to the care. I hope we do, because we want to do this for good reasons. So the question about um, statistical power and having papers discussing a group of athletes, I don't think there's a lot of literature out there, but there are individual cases. And I think we all suspect the same thing. We see um, swimmers in college get venous TOS, blood clots in the veins, and volleyball players as well. We see baseball pitchers getting neurogenic TOS. Um, so I hope that's a start to answer your question. Thank you. Valerie, can TOS cause bursitis or cause other tendon issues? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that directly. Um, but you alter your biomechanics because of pain. You know, people, there's something called guarding. People with appendicitis or diverticulitis, if you go to examine their belly, their belly muscles get really hard because they don't want you touching. So the same thing, if you're having pain because of the nerves coming out of your neck and through your thoracic outlet, you're going to adopt a, a different posture and you're going to do things that are not the most efficient way to do them. And you may put extra stress on a rotator cuff or some of your muscles. So I think it's common to get superimposed muscle and tendon stresses and strains um, because of the abnormal posture. You know, um, some of our other people like TOS Unbound could probably answer that because they work more directly with clinically examining patients. But that's the feeling I get from a lot of the clinical docs we work with. Thank you. Freya Moon. Hi there. Good to see you back again. Is there any data on stem cell application for TOS? That's really great. Um, Dr. Rob Hagen, who was here last week, was starting to talk about, we didn't go into great detail, using these active biologics for hydro dissection, where you get the needle down very close to the nerve and you inject something, a liquid around the nerve, either saline or some kind of biologic agent like stem cells or PRP that induces stem cells. And you try to get that to, to work on the inflammatory change in the area. Uh, I've searched recently and while there's some literature for things like Achilles tendinosis or ligament ruptures or stresses in the orthopedic literature, there's not much on doing... Um, hydro dissection around the nerves, but I think there's a lot of promise to it. People like Dr. Hagen have had good experience with it so far, and I used to do some of them before the pandemic. So uh, something we should keep an eye on, and that may uh, really help reduce the need for surgery in many patients. It's a good question. 
Type in faster. Have you seen or heard of the differential diagnosis of T4 syndrome? Uh, if TOS is ruled out, yet the patient presents with TOS-like symptoms, would T4 syndrome be considered? Uh, no, I don't know what T4 syndrome is. The, the fourth thoracic nerve, though, doesn't go to the arm. So, um, I, I mean, just guessing here. But if there's some involvement of T4, it usually goes to the chest and upper abdomen. T4 is not a segment that goes out to the arms. So I wouldn't think it's confused with TOS, but I'll go look it up. Sorry, I don't have an answer for that. Thank you. How can I reach out to you? Okay. Thank you, uh, Valerie. So for everybody, um, go to our website, tosmri.com. The last menu over on the right side, you can pull that down and there's a contact us and you fill out a couple of quick boxes and we'll get back to you within a day. Um, we're, we're happy to get any questions or any suggestions or any news items on TOS, things like T4 syndrome, you know, ask us a question. Maybe it's something we can learn that, that's important to know for other patients. We can also connect you with uh, other docs in your area or docs who do teleradiology visits. Um, again, it's a good chance for me to remind everybody to hit the like button and subscribe. I never thought I'd be one of these people. Smash that like button and subscribe so you can hear about every new talk we do. We'll have new stuff coming up. Uh, if you want to reach out to us and request a topic for a talk that we can look into, or you have a doc and you think he or she is a great interview subject and you want to hear more of their opinions, shoot it to us as well. TOSMRI.com. You can also go to TOSeducation.org. And uh, that's managed by Herb Rep, and he does a lot of educational stuff, as the name says, on TOS, and he can help answer questions and connect you with people as well. Danny Davis, Dr. Donahue in Boston has a specialized CT scan that he created for TOS. What is the advantage or disadvantage of the CT scan versus a specialized MRI? So uh, Dean Donahue is a good guy, a uh, smart guy has a lot of experience with TOS, a lot of TOS surgical experience, um, more traditionalist in terms of the approach, I believe he takes the supraclavicular approach, but you know he's done lots of them, has huge uh, success. Uh, really good guy to talk to. For me, uh, very stimulating to talk to him because he's got lots of ideas of what is and isn't and what could be. He's not set in stone. You know, He listens, he talks, we exchange. One of the things on my list is to spend more time talking with him because I don't get enough of it. Um, he probably worked with the radiology department to develop a CT scan. I've seen a couple of them come through. Um, you know, the, the MGH Massachusetts general hospital is a great place with lots of really good docs around. Um, there's a couple things that I think MRI has over CT. Uh, one is that CT, you need a radiation dose where MRI doesn't, uh, Secondly, the soft tissues are better seen in MRI than CT by a significant amount. Um, disadvantages would be that uh, MRI takes longer in the scanner than a CT scan. Um, I think for CT scan, an advantage would be you can see the bones really well. The bone detail is great. Bones are sharp white, and the contrast in the blood vessels is sharp white. So if you're looking just for the blood vessels and the bones... CT will show that, and not just to a radiologist who's trained to see shades of gray, but to any doc, and even the patients can see it very clearly. It's a beautiful technique. But I think that um, I would not trade that personally. I can see the bones with very rare exceptions. Do I really need more bone detail? And that's just because I've done so many of these. I can see the soft tissues way better. Um, and there's value in that. And you see a lot of changes within the soft tissues, as well as relationship of one soft tissue to another that you can't quite get on a CT. Um, you can see the spinal cord and all the nerve roots that come out from it better on MRI. It's just better for general neurologic stuff. So, um, you, you know, it's good. I mean, you know, it's good that he uses imaging because a lot of vascular surgeons may not use imaging. And so, he, you know, it's good that he uses imaging. Dr. Donahue, I mean. Um, I just, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, for over 20 years now, I guess. And, you know, I truly believe in it. It's evolved over time. I know a lot of docs who value what we do, and those images are very important for them making decisions. And uh, if it were me, I would get the MRI instead of a CT for the reasons I mentioned, as long as it's read by an experienced radiologist. Just trust me, a lot of radiologists just don't deal with TOS. 
They'll do an MRI of the brachial plexus with no arm motion. They'll say the brachial plexus is normal, which it usually is. But this is not a disease of the brachial plexus. It's a disease of all the things around it causing problems on top of the brachial plexus. So um, that's my two cents. And if you, you know, you want to see a good doc for TOS, you know, you, you couldn't do any better, I think, on the level of quality than a Dr. Donahue. Thank you for the question. All right. If we don't have other questions, Herb, do we have the next scheduled talk coming up? There we go. September 27th. Ah, uh -huh, that's going to be a good one. We're going to have a panel of doctors discussing some tough cases. I believe we're going to have Dr. Art Jenkins and Dr. Tracy Newkirk, both of whom are awesome at this, along with me. And uh, one day I can be as awesome as them. That'll be really good. I learn a lot from them. And I highly recommend this because we'll take a few cases and we'll dissect out our thought process on how we would address this. And that's September 27. Uh, again, help us out on social media. Uh, we're trying to grow our social media. We're on Twitter, TOSMRI, and Instagram, TOSMRI, and uh, Facebook as well. And you can find our YouTube channel. Also, um, our website is TOSMRI.com. Uh, another great website is TOSEducation.org, run by Herb Rep. And that's got tons of good educational stuff, and they help promote videos, and they help do a lot of the work, a lot of the legwork that's invisible here to get guests on and to arrange these uh, shows and to spread the word. Um, tell your other people that you speak with on social media, other TOS patients, to check us out. You know, we, we believe we want we want to get our numbers bigger, and we we think that'll help as we spread the word. Uh, you can reach out to me directly through TOSMRI.com if you have specific questions like specific diagnoses or suggestions for talks or questions about TOS, and I'm glad to answer or to get you to people who can answer. So until next time, it's great having everybody here. Thank you for the participation and the great questions. Again, I'm Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy, and let's make it better for all our future TOS patients. Thanks again. See you next time.